is risen. And we echo, he is risen indeed. With those words, the word, who was in the beginning, takes root in our soul. He is risen. Yes, he is risen indeed. We say it again and again, year after year, to remember that Jesus is alive, that we are alive in him. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We claim this and proclaim this to every burdened heart, every broken spirit and sin we've committed. He is risen. Yes, he is risen indeed. And because he is alive, we have life. We have meaning. We have forgiveness and freedom. For through his death and resurrection, we have been reconciled. We have been brought close to God. We are reminded that nothing can separate us, not even death. He is risen. Oh, he is risen indeed. May those words not lose their joy, their beauty, their power. For through his power, our sin is defeated. Our shame is overcome. The same power that conquered the grave lives in you and lives in me. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. For his resurrection brings new meaning to our life, new hope, new joy. And because of his resurrection, we will also be resurrected. Like his body that was raised from death, we too have been brought from death to life. Our old selves are gone. Our new selves are here. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We declare this when we doubt it. Proclaim it when we don't feel it. We speak these words to our weary souls and to our wandering hearts. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We remember that today. We remember it tomorrow. And we let that be the driving force behind our life. We will live out this truth in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, and in our workplaces, and everywhere we go. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And that makes us righteous. Not because of anything we've done, but because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have the honor of living out that gift. Out of our gratitude, we give our lives back to the one who is risen. May today and every day be the time to say thank you as we join all of creation in saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and glory. We join our voices together to say, Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning, everyone. He is risen. We can do better, right? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Will you stand and join us in this first song? Oh, 
Good morning. Welcome to Easter morning at First Reformed Church in Granville. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we're excited that you're here with us. And a very special welcome to those of you that are guests. We hope we can meet you after the service. It's a day to celebrate the day that he rose from the dead. Jesus um, knew he had to die to wash away people's sins. So um, some people took him to Pontius Pilate. Uh, Pilate didn't think he should be sentenced to death, so he sent him away. But then um, they brought him back a second time, and this time Pontius Pilate accepted accepted him and so he was nailed to a cross he was um mocked and spat at he probably might have actually been betrayed like felt betrayed by his own people yeah, so this there. one is jesus because he's nailed they put nails into his hand and nails into his feet and put a thorn crown on his head that jesus died on the cross and they nailed his hands and feet. And then three days later, he rose from the dead. He was, he was riding on a donkey, and everybody thought he was going to be in, like, clean clothes and riding on a clean horse. And, they, and everybody was like, ugh, like, don't respect him. And everybody nailed him to a cross, and he had a cross, and he died. They nailed him to the cross, but then he rose from the dead three days later, and it was a miracle. Um, Jesus died and then came back alive all for us. He had to carry the cross to where he, where they wanted it, and then they nailed nailed him on the cross three days later. The angel sent him back alive. When Jesus died on the cross for us, he like was put in a tomb and but then on like the third day or something, like rose from the dead. Did Jesus come back alive? He went into this cave and after three days his body was out of the cave. And uh, then on the third day, he rose from the dead, and the rock was not there, like the tombstone. Of the woman would have been surprised to see that the cloth that he was wrapped in would have been, or was folded. Uh, he wanted to be back, and he, on Easter day, he arrived in uh, a cave. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine that God's with us whenever wherever we are for all of a, for all of us who believe in Jesus and God um go to heaven and see their family members that Jesus died to wash away all our sins he promised to love us and he promised to do good stuff for us cuz it brings um happiness to people Please take a moment to greet those around you.
This is the good news. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never put it out. This is the good news. Once we were no people, now we are God's people. Christ is our peace, the undestructible. The undestructible peace we now share with each other. Farney. I like your white shoes. Maybe I'll preach in uh, white shoes one day and a white belt. I'll look cool, hip, and trendy. So some people said you can wear a suit. You know, I, I don't, if you know me, I don't wear a lot of suits. 
Um, someone said, you going to wear a suit on Easter? I put a suit on this morning, and then I just got real hot and sticky and sweaty, so I took it off. Um, I wasn't going to say my kids spilled stuff on it, but that would be a lie. So um, I just was uncomfortable. I like to move. So, um, hey, it smells like uh, Easter, doesn't it? Or spring. Uh, I don't know which one it is, but um, it is so good to see all of you this morning. My name is Jeff. I am uh, the lead pastor here at First, uh, and it is just great to be gathered on this Easter, Easter morning. Uh, let's, let's pray. Father, may your word be our guide. May your spirit be our only teacher. In the glory of Jesus Christ, our single concern. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and grab those. We're going to be in Matthew 28. In just a few minutes, the words will also be on the screen behind me. Uh, It is... So it's my inclination on Easter to always kind of move towards like the historicity of the resurrection. Like that's just my bend. That's how I'm built to show us the stunning volume of evidence that uh, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified by Romans and then three days later he came back to life. And, And not just as a matter of faith, but as a matter of historical fact. See, the volume of evidence around, uh, there was around seven to 800 eyewitnesses. Um, and so that's just my, my bend, is to go there and camp out there. It's kind of where I like to geek out a little bit, that, that this story, that what we're celebrating today, the story we're about to read, that it's not fairy tale, right? It's not um, Greek mythology. Uh, it actually happened, and it changes everything, And so my bend is to camp out there, but I think a better use of our time today is to not stay there, which if if that's you and you're like, man, the the history and the evidence and those things, like I kind of commend to you a 500-page book by N.T. Wright. It's fantastic. It's called The Resurrection. Um, If that's your thing and you want to see the evidence of this story, of the resurrection, that's a great read. Also, Jesus in his eyewitnesses. But today... I think a better use of our time for the next few minutes is to talk about the implications of the resurrection. Because if Christ indeed did raise from the grave, which we believe he did, it's Easter morning, it's why we're here, well, that has significant implications for your life and for my life. And so that's where we're going to camp out for the next few minutes. Um, So Matthew 28, I would like to invite up my friend Rebecca. She is going to read our scripture passage Um, Matthew 28, starting in verse 1, and the words should be on the screen. After After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly, with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples, Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Thanks, Rebecca. This is God's word. So, as I said, here's what I want to do. I just want to look at a handful of implications of what this thing means for us. Uh, I want to look at what we have been saved from, and then ultimately what we have been saved to or for. So here's the first implication. If Jesus uh, was resurrected from the grave, which again we believe he was, then our rescue and our victory is complete. Our rescue and our victory is complete. Here's, here's what I mean. Um, death 
rules and reigns because sin entered the cosmos. And since death was uh, not part of God's original design, but sin entered the world, well then Jesus resurrecting from the, the, the grave, from the dead, shows us that God has conquered death and he's also conquered sin. So he has conquered death and he has conquered sin, which as an implication for us means that the power of Jesus' forgiveness is available to us all. See, the death of Jesus and his subsequent resurrection means that all of our sins, past, present, and future, have been forgiven. Now think about that. Those things in our past that we're ashamed of, forgiven. Our current struggles, forgiven. The things that we will do in the future, forgiven. I mean, thank God that he knows what we're going to do and yet he has already made provisions for that. That is a stunning grace that doesn't really play itself out in many other human relationships. See, God is freely going, hey, you're going you're gonna to mess up. You're going to fall short. And you're going to promise me that you're not and then you're going to fall short and yet I'm still going to love you. And then you're going to fall short again despite the fact that I loved you after those mistakes, and then you're going to make more mistakes, and I'm going to love you again. And all of that is caught up in the resurrection of my son and his death on your behalf. And that is fantastic news, that all of our sins, past, present, future, forgiven. It also means that our sins are forgiven fully, freely, and forever. Fully, freely, and forever. Fully, in that if he only died for some of our sins and not all of our sins, well, he would still be in the grave, right? But because he is not, because of the resurrection, the bill has been paid in full. Like if Jesus was still in the grave, well, then we would have reason to be anxious because we wouldn't know if all of our sins were forgiven. But because he's not still in the grave, the bill has been paid in full. We're also forgiven freely, He did not just give us this love and give us this forgiveness so that we could repay him one day. You see, one of my favorite stories kind of in that final week of Jesus' life is actually while he's on the cross. And he has that little sidebar conversation with the thief on the cross next to him. And he says to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. Now that is a loaded statement, and we could unpack that for like five hours, but we're not. We've got to get home to our Easter meal. So, but he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now that, that brother didn't really have much of a shot to repent, right? Like he just had to hold out for a few more hours on the cross, and then he would die and be in paradise. I mean, this dude doesn't get baptized. He doesn't really live out this legitimate, like, my life has changed. He doesn't come down off of the cross and and give back to those he stole from. He is just freely given grace. And that's your story. That's my story. We're forgiven fully. We're We're forgiven freely. And then what is our future? Our future is eternal life starting right now. And that is the best news in the universe. It empowers us, it forms us, it strengthens us to keep getting up, to keep following Jesus, to not believe the lie that I'm just a disappointment, to to not believe the lie that I've got to clean myself up and then one day Jesus will love me. I've, I've talked about this before, but Jesus does not love some future version of us. Jesus doesn't regret saving us, right? It's not like he thought this was a great idea 2,000 years ago, but now that he sees us up close, he's like, yeah, I totally regret it, right? I want to do over, like trade this one in for someone else, right? That's not true at all, and our confidence is rooted in the resurrection. And so that is the first implication, that we are forgiven past, present, future sins, and we're forgiven fully, freely, and forever. And that changes everything. That launches us into a life of freedom. Here's another thing that we see in the resurrection. 
we see the seriousness of God's love for us and the seriousness of the kingdom of God, God's kingdom being made visible in the world. Now, where I think we are kind of malinformed is is we are real familiar with what we've been saved from and we have not yet fully embraced what we are what we are saved to. We for the most part understand here's what I'm saved from yet until we've fully embraced what we've been saved to we're malinformed right like we haven't just been saved from if we've just been saved from well we're going to get bored we're going to tend to be spectators but when we recognize that not only are we saved from but we are saved for or to something well then we come alive then the world starts to look different and so what are we saved from well we're saved from being slaves to sin we're also saved from the wrath of God. And again, I could camp out there for the next two hours, but I want to look at what we're saved to and what we're saved for. You you see, I think we miss out on the vibrancy of life when we stop and put a period there. When we stop and put a period after, here's what we're saved from. Because we're not just saved from, but we're saved to. We're saved for. It's not like Jesus saves us and says, here's what I want you to do, okay? Holy huddle. I want you to get together. I want you to read my book. I want you to sing songs about me and call it a day. That's funny because we're in church. Um, I'm not entirely serious there, right? But that's not what he saves us for. He saves us for so much more than that. We haven't just been saved from, we've been saved to. See, all of the questions that are gnawing at us, like where do we place our hope? Where do we find our hope? Uh, Who am I? What's my purpose? All of that, all of it is answered in the resurrection, not just the cross. And so in the resurrection, here's what we've been saved for. So three things, kind of three sub-implications. Here is what we are saved for. One, we are saved for what the Bible calls union with Christ. Union with Christ. Now, if I could explain this maybe in a way that provokes your imagination, we have been saved for a vibrant, living, active relationship with Jesus Christ. Not just knowing about Jesus Christ, but to be in Christ and Christ in us. There is a vibrancy that transcends like white-knuckled moral betterment that we have been saved for. We're not just saved for trying harder. We're actually saved for new life. And that's what we're invited in. That's what we're called into. In John 17, we're told that we're invited to participate in the life of the triune God. Tim Keller wrote a fantastic book called The Reason for God. And in that book, he has an entire chapter called The Dance. Anyone ever read this book, Reason for God? It's fantastic. One person, okay. We love learning around here. Um, (laughs) I'm kidding. Um, You're here. So Reason for God, he's got an entire chapter called The Dance, where he describes the nature of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He says... Jesus is like, oh, look at the Father. Oh, how the Father loves you. Oh, we should gaze upon the Father. And the Spirit is like, look at Jesus. Jesus loves you. I'm going to make much of Jesus. I'm going to give you a heart for Jesus. And the Father is like, look at this, the Son and the Spirit. And there's this dance of joy that Genesis says is so full of life and so full of joy that it explodes out onto the canvas of creation where it continues to push out in every direction imaginable. And in John 17, Jesus is like, do you want to come dance with us? Do you want to come dance with us? Do you want to come get right in the middle of this life that's at the epicenter of reality? You see, we haven't just been saved from, we've been saved to, we've been saved for, we've been saved to have union with Christ. And that's not just knowing about, that's knowing. And I think we have a hard time teasing these two things out, don't we? Like the sheer amount of input that we get in our day and age can leave us confused to where we feel like we know somebody, but we just know about them. Right? We can follow their social media. We can read their book. 
We can watch their documentary. We can watch their 30 for 30 and we can, be, we can think, well, I know this person. Like, I know what they have for breakfast. I know what they like to do on date night. Like, I know how they're wired. Like, I know this person. And we don't know them. We just know a lot about them. Here's an example. Does anyone here know what a Swifty is? <laughs> if, if you don't, do you know who Taylor Swift is? Okay. Uh, Taylor Swift, okay, so um, there are fans of Taylor Swift, right? Like people who just enjoy Taylor Swift, they enjoy her music. I think I'd put myself in that camp. Like I respect a good artist when I see one, okay? So there's like the fans of Taylor Swift, and then you've got like, you know, like way over here, you've got the Swifties, okay? And if you ever listen to a Swiftie talk about Taylor Swift, um, they will talk to you as if, like, they just had lunch with her yesterday, okay? Where they really don't know Taylor Swift at all. They just know a whole bunch of stuff about her. You with me? And, and we do this all the time, don't we? We do it with people we look, look up to. We do it with famous athletes. We do it with people we've never met, yet we talk about them in such a way that we, that we know them. You see, there are few things more beautiful than knowing someone. What we have been saved to or for is to actually know God, not just a list of things about him, but as someone that we've actually experienced, someone that we're actually walking with, someone who we could say, let me, tell, let me introduce you to somebody. Let me tell you about my friend. Let me tell you about this, this, this Jesus who has saved my life and who has changed my life. Let me tell you about what's going on between me and him right now. Now, we have been saved for union with Christ. And it's so much better than that white-knuckled moral betterment. I can list off a bunch of things versus I know the creator of the universe. So not only have we been saved for union with Christ, we've also been invited into community. A couple weeks ago, I was over at Family Fair out in Hudsonville, and we were going to our friend's uh, birthday party. And I was um, in the aisle looking to buy some things, and there was someone next to me, and um, she was looking for stuff as well, and all of a sudden, she hopped on the phone. And she was like, hey, uh, what type of drinks do you want for tonight? Like, what are you thinking? And I'm like kind of eavesdropping, but kind of trying to figure out what I want to get. And then all of a sudden, the person next to me on my right two feet over, starts answering her on her phone. And I'm like, I'm like, uh, are you guys talking to each other? Like, what is this? Here you go. I'm not that, like, intimidating, I don't think. Um, you know what I mean? Or, or maybe you've been in, in a get-together or a circle, or maybe this is generally speaking for younger people, but you've seen, you know, all those kids on their phones in a circle just texting, probably texting each other. What's happening in the kind of world that you and I are living in, and, and look, I'm not anti-technology. I'm preaching from an iPad, right? I love technology, but what technology has done is it has created a very thin understanding of what it means to be known and what it means to be in community. We are more and more and more connected, yet we are more and more and more lonely. We're more and more anxious. We're more and more depressed. Why? because we're not known and we don't know. See, the only way for us to ever experience love and grace in a way that is transformative, so the only way for us to experience love and grace that's transformative is to be fully known and then experience love and grace. Because as long as we have that like up, right, that invisible, like, hey, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good, bro, all is well. Like, the kids were nuts, but I'm doing great, right? Like, and we don't invite people into what's happening in our lives. We can never truly experience grace. We can never truly understand love because what happens whenever someone says, hey, man, I, I love you. Man, I really love you. What happens internally is we start to say, well, that person doesn't really know me. Like, if, if, if he knew this, if she knew that, if they knew about this over there, well, then they would reject me. Then they wouldn't say they love me. So we can't fully receive love. 
It's until we can invite people into our imperfection that we can get to that space. And that's the beauty of the church. That's what I think the church is for. You see, the cross of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus lays the ground flat because the cross says to us all, there's only one perfect one. And it's not a pastor, it's not an athlete, it's not any person you know. The perfect one is Christ and he has outed us all as imperfect. And that should, like God help us, that should help us be more comfortable with our imperfections. Right? There's real strength found in our imperfections to, to be able to say to people that we're close to within really what I believe the context of the church community, hey, here's what, here's what I'm going through. Here's what's going on, my, on in my life. And for someone else to say, oh man, I'm in the same boat, praise him. And then for us to walk through those imperfections together in a community of safety and grace and hope and love. Like that's transformative in a way that like suburban Christianity just isn't possible right? Like we, we live in a backyard culture. We've got nine foot privacy fences. We've got barbed wire across the top. You know, we've got guard dogs out back and we're only going to let in who we want to let in. Someone rings the doorbell. What do we do? We dive behind the couch. <laughs> we want to let in who we want to let in. It's why our staff has talked a lot about relaunching small groups in the fall. Because for us, there's nothing sweeter than getting people together to, A, not only learn about Jesus and grow in our faith and have theological conversations, but to also be willing to go to those places of honesty and difficulty. And so we've been saved for union with Christ. We've been saved for, or we've been invited into community. And then lastly, We've been saved for the mission of God. We've been saved for the mission of God. Go blue. We've been saved for the mission of God. Part of the reason, part of the reason that more and more churches are looking like conferences. Do you know what I mean? Like, come in, hear a good speaker, sing some good songs, but not really, like, let it change us and embrace it and be sent out to do the work of God. Like, right? And, and the reason why that is is because we haven't fully believed that every, every man, every woman, every child in this room who is full of the Holy Spirit has been gifted, wired, placed by God in neighborhoods, in classrooms, at different places of work for the glory of God and for our joy. Like we are to live out the gospel in our everyday lives. There's always something else for us to get involved in that God is up to. Always a neighbor to pray for. Always a coworker who needs a little encouragement. Always someone else to invite around the table. And if you're like, oh, bro, like, you don't know, I got like 15 kids, you know, 32 sports, like, I don't have time for any of that. All I'm saying is, you got a lot of opportunity, right? Like, you got a lot of opportunity. You need a bigger table to invite people into. And we are so rushed. And so I'm not saying that we need to add things. I'm saying we need to invite things. We need to invite things. Like, you're, you're, everyone here eat lunch typically? Show of hands, I just want to make sure we're, we're taking care of ourselves, okay? I, we, we eat lunch, right? We have dinner. We do things that are a part of our normal routine. What does it look like to invite people into those spaces? I'm not talking about every day, but what does it look like to invite people into those spaces? Some of you are like, dude, like, we're just driving to get from point A to point B, and we're just throwing nuggets in the back. Like, I don't know, we can't really invite people into that. You know, throw another kid back there, huh? Don't take a kid, okay? Don't steal anyone's kid. But, but to be more mindful of, I want to leverage the time that I have for the glory of God and for my joy. Man, what we've been saved from is incredible. And it completely changes our lives. But what we've been saved for, in my opinion, matches it. What we've been saved for is incredible. To be mindful 
if I want to leverage the time I have for the glory of God and my joy. Like, we will not be able to experience all that Christ has for us just sitting in here, listening to me speak, singing some songs, because his call on our lives, what we've been saved for, is so much bigger. You, not just me, you have been created by God. You've been gifted by God. You've been placed by God. You've been wired by God. For our joy and his glory as a part of this like cosmic take your kid to work day. God wants to set free. God wants to save. God wants to restore. And guess what? He wants to do it through you and through me and all of us in this room. Maybe you've never heard that. Or maybe you've never really believed that. But God wants to actually extend the kingdom through you through you. I want all of us to step into resurrection life, full and joyful surrender to understanding that the Spirit of God is going to use us in ways that are beyond our imaginations. Not just because we're gifted, not just because we're smart, not just because fill in the blank, but because you have been saved for something. And so let us rejoice in what we've been saved from and let us step into what we've been saved for. And man, if you're here and, and, and you're hearing this message for the first time or if you're here and, and you're like, I don't know Jesus, well, that invitation is for you. First and foremost, that invitation of what you can be saved from is for you. I mean, it's for all of us, but it's for you. And that's the life that we get to step into. So friends, may we be a resurrected people who don't just look at what we've been saved from, but we look at who we've been saved, what we've been saved to, union with Christ, created for community, and a mission that God has put us in charge of. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for the chance to be together and marvel at the resurrection of Christ, that we have been forgiven of sin, but we have also been invited into participation in the triune life of God and the mission of God. Lord, thank you that you don't just save us out of this world, but you save us for it. I pray that you might, as I've already prayed, provoke our imaginations today. What would it look like to walk in resurrection power? What would it look like to not just lean into being forgiven for sin, which is so beautiful and so right and so good, and there is much we need to be forgiven for, and we thank you that fully, freely, and forever you have forgiven us, yesterday, today, and forever. But I ask now that you would captivate us with how you want to use us, captivate us by how you've placed us, captivate us by the call you've placed on our lives to live into our design and to live into your plan, to live into the power made available to us. Give us a hunger and thirst for more. Give us by your grace the ability to say yes. It's for your beautiful name, I pray. Amen. As we continue to worship and praise this morning, we invite the deacons to come forward. While they are doing so, if you are visiting with us this morning, first off, welcome. We'd love to have you here. Additionally, if you would like to connect with us more, we invite you in the back of all the pews, there is just this little card. You can write your name, some contact information on there. If you're really fast, you can turn it into the basket. Otherwise, you can turn it in at the welcome desk after the service, and we would love to connect with you. Additionally, so I don't forget, there are friendship pads and the end of the aisles. If you would sign and pass those at this time as well. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for today. We thank you that you came for us, but you also came to us and for our future as well. We give you praise for all of that, that you are alive in this place, in this world, that you haven't given up on it, that there is a direction and a hope. 
So, Lord, we ask that you would take and that you would magnify this offering this morning for that, for your purpose, for your plan. And we ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You were the one at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. Jesus, you got heaven down. Our sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name.
So good to see all of you here. My name is Melanie Kilgore. I'm one of the pastors here. We have a few prayer updates uh, for you and some announcements. Uh, first, Ethel Karsten is at home uh, recovering from a stroke. Don Elderink is having surgery on April 3. Um, update on Brian and Brad Dykstra's sister, Heather. She did have a heart procedure this week, and all is going well after that. So can continue to pray for their family that's with them. And Carol Waddell is um, in the hospital with congenitive heart failure and has some upcoming uh, procedure. We just don't know all the details on that yet. And then I, I encourage you to look at your bulletin so you know what's coming up. Uh, Specifically this week, we have a stay and play for spring break. This is for kids and parents. Uh, Wednesday, 10 a.m. to noon in the gym. My family will be there. would love to see others there as well. And then um, I won't mention all the other upcoming events going on, but um, there will be a... There's a number with details in your bulletin. So a young adult axe throwing event, euchre tournament, and a spring women's and girls brunch. So if any of those things sound of interest to you, check out your bulletin for some more details. Um, and if you were one of the people who placed a flower um, in honorary, uh, an honor of somebody who has passed on, we encourage you to please remember to grab those before you leave today. Um, and then finally, if you would like to join us for a hallelujah chorus, Please, come on up. We'll give you a couple minutes um, to get on up there for this. Uh, it'll be after the next song, so feel free to move during that time. Uh, please stand for our final song together.
Friends, can I tell you something? I love serving at this place, man. What a Sunday. Thank you to everyone who made this happen. Thank you to the choir. Thanks, brother. Uh, thanks to everyone else that was a part of this service. Uh, I believe Lou Stelma did the flowers and set those up, and, and, and so many more people helped with this Sunday. But I am just grateful for this community. Uh, I'm grateful that you are people who are walking in union with Christ for a mission that is so much bigger than we will ever know. Go in peace.